Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so I'm not an afternoon person, but I'll, you know, I have a lot of content to cover, so hopefully I'll try. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to go a little, little faster, but hopefully I'll be here for some time to, you know, if you have any questions after, after this, you can definitely uh, more than welcome to stay back and I can address that. All right, so today's presentation I'm going to be covering on orally, on OPCA's perspective on quality consideration for generic orally native products. So this is a standard disclaimer, and I'm not just going to go over that. I know we had gone this before. So there are three things which I'm going to be covering today in my presentation. The first thing I'm going to give you uh, some brief update about the guidance update on MDI DPI products. Uh, secondly, I'm going to just cover something on the submission challenges and what are some of the expectations from regulatory perspective. I have some tips at the end of the presentation. Uh, and the last thing, I'm just going to cover something on pre-market changes and what are some of the considerations from drug product quality. So as you know about the orally inhaled drug product, which, you know, which are used for delivering one or two, uh, one or more drug substance to the site of action, in this case, respiratory and respiratory tract. Um, and they're used for uh, many diseases as a COPD, asthma, as an infection disease. Uh, and device plays a very integral part of the delivered dose. And we heard, of, of heard about this uh, as far as from other presentation as well for the combination product. And that's one of the reasons my earlier part of the presentation is going to be more focused towards the device aspect. So before I just dive into this topic, I just thought maybe I'll just go over some of the significance on why we are here and to discuss about the inhalation drug products. Um, so if you look at the, uh, on your slide, on your left side, basically on the pictorial, as you can see about it, there's alarming rate. I mean, as, as you see the uh, numbers, uh, the asthma patients are like growing uh, globally. It's about 235 million worldwide uh, patient population and COPD itself is about greater than 200 million uh, patient. Um, and it looks like it's predicted to be the third uh, leading cause of death uh, by 2030. Um, also, I was at the AM meeting last week, and I think even uh, Dr. Cook also presented yesterday in her presentation in terms of generic drug cost saving. So as you can see from the, on the right side pictorial, the generic drug saved uh, US healthcare across to $265 billion, and that was in 2017. And as far as the respiratory tract delivery is, is concerned, as you can see, it's in, way in the bottom. And you, know, you can understand why we need urgent need for generic drug products. So just going to order inhalation drug products, they are for, fall into four main categories. One is inhalation aerosols, also known as meter dose inhalers. Inhalation powders, also known as dry powder inhalers. And inhalation solution suspensions, again, those are the products which are used with the general nebulizers and inhalation sprays. So CEDAR has published two uh, guidances on this topic. The first guidance was actually published a while back, which was on nasal sprays and inhalation solution suspension. Um, there was another guidance also, which was specifically addressing MDI and DPI product, which was also uh, issued back in 98. Uh, recently, like four months back, uh, CEDAR has issued a revised guidance on MDI DPI product. Uh, and again, this guidance has not been finalized. Uh, it's still open for comment period. I believe it's still, I mean, if you still have any comments, you can just send it to the, uh, the email address, which is on the front of the guidance. Uh, however, this guidance, you know, again, it's not a legally binding document, but we do recommend that the sponsors do follow the recommendations um, and, you know, as a, as a starting point. So just to give you a brief update on the guidance, uh, I'm not going to go over um, many of the issues, but I'm just going to go over some of the critical issues uh, which has been addressed in the guidance. So the first thing is about, uh, as I think uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew just spoke about this uh, in his presentation about the combination products, and Dr. Witzman also spoke about something on human factors. So as you know about it, you know, from now, I mean, so far, that the MDI DPI products are combination products as defined in the 21 CFR 3.2, and they are subject, as, as a combination product, they are subject to current good manufacturing practices uh, as part of the part four, uh, part four compliance. So, so just, just to, in terms of Part 4 compliance, uh, I know there, there's a lot of questions about it, uh, you know, in terms of what, what, what the sponsor needs to do about it. I mean, there's a guidance I have provided at the bottom. So, I um, mean, I guess a good guidance from FDA in terms of, you know, what uh, sponsors can do in terms of complying with their GMP regulations, uh, you know, in terms of streamlined approach or non-streamlined approach. I'm not going to go over that. However, I do recommend there is a conference which is going to be the October uh, DIA conference on the combination product, and there is going to be a lot of uh, talks, especially going with the GMP uh, aspect of the combination product. So I would definitely recommend that. The other aspects of the guidance, which CMC guidance does cover, is in terms of the development approaches consistent with the, co consistent with the quality by design approach. 
and it does cover a lot of aspects for inhalation drug product, especially covering what are some of the quality target product profile requirements, what are some of the elements which a sponsor needs to consider when developing an inhalation product. It also covers a lot of the critical quality attributes, both from MDI and DPI perspective. It does cover product and process development, and also it covers control strategy, and, and the last not the least, very important, is about a characterization study. And the reason I'm just saying it's very important because I think a lot of times we see a sponsors coming back and forth and we have a lot of deficiency, especially to do with the characterization study. And the New York guidance does have special recommendations about it, what a sponsor needs to consider in terms of their device and drug constituent part and what studies needs to be performed. Yeah. Sorry. So another thing I also wanted to actually, I actually haven't mentioned in this, uh, in this slide, uh, there's one more thing which guidance does cover basically in particular with the uh, requirement of 820 requirement for device quality system regulations. And as you know about the, this product, our combination product, so there is certain design control requirements which are again based on the Code of, uh, Code of Federal Regulation 820.3. This product needs to meet those requirements and that goes with MDI DPI. So next thing I just want to uh, talk about pre-market submission challenges uh, for generic for this product and what are some of the quality ex perspective expectations. Um, and it's very important to understand, you know, in terms of what are the review disciplines uh, expectations and how to balance that extent of information which gets submitted into the ANDA. And as I, as I said beginning of my presentation that my, my focus is going to be mainly on the device constraint part. So the reason is because there's a large, massive volume of information which just gets communicated to the, uh, to the FDA uh, when the submission comes. So there's a large body of device information. And as you can understand, the complexity and uh, complexity of the product, the pharmaceutical development report not only has a drug constraint part, also a device constraint part. So the combination, the pharmaceutical development basically is a combination of, you know, the whole combination product development report. Uh, including, we also had in this past two days, we spoke about uh, the pre anda correspondence meeting. So there's a lot goes uh, before the ANDA sponsor submits the uh, submit the ANDA. There's also a lot of a discussion between the agency and the sponsor in terms of pre anda their development approaches. So in fact, even that information gets submitted within the ANDA. And, and even Dr. Michael, as he said earlier about the bridging information. So if a sponsor does any kind of a changes, so in fact, that also, change, that also package gets submitted within the ANDA. The other challenges which are associated with the device information is the location of submission. Uh, and we understand the current ECTD uh, location uh, is not formatted specifically for the combination product. And it's, for example, 3 to, uh, P24 and P7, it talks about container closure system. Uh, however, it doesn't address for the combination product itself. So we have seen inconsistent location across the companies. Uh, sometimes it goes under P24, sometimes it goes under P7, and also goes in regional information. Uh, the important thing about that sometimes, you know, we find the information also located in the module file, uh, and it goes back and forth, and that creates a lot of review time, uh, you know, issues. And we do understand there is a, not a unified guidance in terms of requirement for device development is concerned. Uh, definitely CMC is one of the guidance which provides, but there are other guidance as well which covers uh, other regulations for device. Uh, as far as GMP is concerned, there's a GMP guidance on device. Um, also, as you know, as the earlier presenter spoke about the human factor study, so there's a lot, lot information which you know comes through the uh, this application, and sponsors do struggle to provide the information. So what I'm going to do is for the next next slide, uh, basically I'm just going to provide what are some of the quality review disciplines expectation in terms of where the information should pro be recited or be provided as far as the device development is report is concerned. Uh, and again, I do understand the complexity of the device. So again, those are the few recommendations. It doesn't include the complete set of requirements. However, I do uh, recommend that you want to look at the new CMC guidance, which also provides further information on where the device information to res should reside. So as far as the P24 is concerned, you want to ensure that you include the development report, not just for the device, but all, just has to be the development report for the entire combination product, considering the drug constraint, drug constraint and device constraint part. For the demonstrating the suitability of the container closure system, uh, suitability in terms of making sure about it that it meets the minimum requirement of accuracy, robustness, uh, and other functionality pro properties of the device. It should include the critical function of the design, including summary of risk management activity. If you have used the ISO 14971 standards, so make sure about it, you include that uh, as well in, in your assessment. 
uh, should include risk assessment for the device attributes and its impact on drug delivery performance. Uh, sh make sure that you include the drug product characterization study. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're gonna uh, con you know, if you're gonna conduct any studies, especially the device robustness of patient in your study as part of your clinical studies, please do make sure that they are uh, they are communicated, they are being provided it provided in the pharmaceutical development report for the referencing to the module file as applicable. Also ensure that there's an assessment of material uh, in terms of extractable leachables, in terms of biocompatibility report, and not, the last, not the least, the elemental impurity as well, which makes sure that it, it's in line with the ICHQ3D uh, requirements. One thing I do recommend, uh, as far as, you know, I know earlier present, uh, presentation, Dr. Michael spoke about the changes, uh, you know, what the agency kind of currently is facing regarding the device changes. So it's very important that if you do make any development, any, any changes during your development, especially for the device uh, components, please do provide a summary of tabular format, what are those changes and how, what, and, and, and changes are made throughout, to what stage of development they have made those changes. As far as the P7 is concerned, you want to ensure that you have included appropriate control strategy for your device. Um, that includes the specification for device constrained parts of assembly and primary secondary packaging. I'm not going to go over all the list, but one thing I definitely want to make sure that, you know, one thing which is very important is you do make, want to make sure that there is a CFA, not just from the sponsor, but also CFA from the supplier are provided within your, uh, within your submission. And again, that's a very critical piece of information because that's the only way a reviewer can, uh, you know, that's the gap knowledge between reviewer can assess whether there is any changes within your device component or subcomponent, especially if it's a critical component, uh, you know, metering wall for MDR, it could be a resistance for device, anything you make, any changes, whether that affects performance. So it's very important that you also provide those uh, within your report. Uh, another thing is if you do refer, if, if type 3 DMFs have been referenced for manufacturing device constraint part or manufacturing process, usually those are not required uh, within the submission, we, we frequently find that and our sponsors do provide for the device, especially for the device constrained part, they do provide all the manufacturing summary and all. Drug product from drug product quality, if we need that information, we can definitely look at the, you know, you want to ensure that you have provided a letter of authorization for those device constrained part, but, but overall you do not need to submit that information within the ANDA. Again, as applicable, this section can be hyperlinked. Uh, you can provide in the original information if needed. Uh, the last thing which I was just talking about that since uh, the, the, this since this combination product drug device combination product they need to be complying with the part 4 requirement uh, there are certain designers design uh, uh, control requirement as for the part 4 which a sponsor has to meet again if you do submit those files uh, as far as the drug product quality is concerned we did not review those again those are the compliance thing so if you do plan to some you know submitting those summary files Please, you know, you can either submit either the P7 or you can submit those re, uh, reports under P3 uh, to R. All right, so next thing which I just want to uh, just cover about uh, the topic which I want to just talk about is a uh, little bit about more to do with the product development, which are very unique to the MDI-DPI product. As you know about it, there are multiple sources of variability which could actually come from, uh, come, uh, Come to this product and that can come from uh, multiple sources for example they can come from the drug substance uh, container closure system and excipients or it could also come from the pharmaceutical in, in from some of the process uh, process development itself and it it's very important that when you're developing your product that you have addressed those risks up front and uh, we have just to give you one example uh, for example the particle size distribution uh, when you're establishing that you have to ensure that you know the, those those particle size distribution Again, are those clinically relevant uh, specifications? Oftentimes, we have seen the sponsors, they do establish those specifications, uh, but sometimes the acceptance criteria are purely based on micronization process capability, and they are not based on your knowledge through the clinical batches. Uh, further, to make the issue more worse, we also seen sometimes the sponsors actually mix, mix lots between, for a, for a given manufacturing batches, they sometimes mix different, two different drug, drug substance lots. And especially if there is a difference in the specification, then that could be a big issue for, for you know, for, from agency perspective. So you want to make sure that you have used uh, a discrete lot as far as the clinical batch is concerned, you know. So again, how, how does one understand the, you know, to understand it to this quality concept, 
Um, as I said earlier, you want to make sure about it that you have adequately addressed your risk and have provided all the information, not just for the drug constrained part, but also for the device constrained part. And uh, agency has had issued pre previously regarding the modified release product, call it by design uh, approach. And so definitely you want to go back, you know, there's a good examples, you may want to refer back to those examples. Uh, but I do recommend that please make sure that up, you know, your control, your, you have established a quality target product profile for based on your combination product requirement that also considers your device aspect, uh, have addressed all the CQAs, have provided all the product and process risk, and at the end you have proposed a control strategy. And this is very important because not only helps, it not only helps to provide further assurance from the reviewer perspective in terms of your drug product quality, but it also further shapes in terms of your quality by design and also design control approach, which I was just mentioning, that, uh, you know, uh, it, which is kind of a requirement for the combination product as such. So again, make sure that whatever the risk management activities has been conducted, please do conduct very early on during your stage, development stage. And again, it not only builds up the opportunity from your lifecycle management perspective, but also it creates more transparency and uh, further facilitates the review process. So this is just uh, what I just uh, said it before. Uh, make sure the risk management activity, either you can use the ICHQ-9 or 14971 risk management activity, please initiate early on during the development. So just going on, shifting to just talk about the pre-market changes. Uh, and again, uh, pre-market changes are often seen for the combination product, and it's very common during the development. I just want to just want to emphasize that uh, some of those changes, especially uh, intended to pro improve the product quality, perform a robustness, could uh, please do ensure that those changes, especially after the registration of clinical batches, uh, you are, have, have provided adequate risk assessment for those changes and also bridging data if the changes are significant, as, as you know, as the earlier, presented, or already, or earlier presentation already said about those issues. So, and uh, again, make sure that information is readily available. Uh, so not only just it helps to, you know, going back and forth reduce re review cycles, but also reduce, reduces the risk of getting CR major. And, as, and also just make sure about it that your registration batches should be conducted with the final finished product form to be marketed device and formulation. So these are some of the pre-market changes. Uh, I just want to make sure, you know, just as a, as a sponsor, you do want to make sure that you do communicate early on for any potential changes. Again, there's a lot of uh, disciplines, not just OPQ and OGD are involved in, the, in reviewing the data. So please ensure that, you know, again, if you do any changes, do communicate with her. It's definitely zero communication uh, during the free panda stage is, you know, that's totally not acceptable. Uh, and do also communicate any partial changes. You know, if you do have any, please do communicate earlier. Uh, just to cover further regarding for more quality consideration, other quality considerations? Okay with the time? All right, <laughs> I might not exceed it. All right, so as far as the quality consideration, I just want to cover up some three aspects, and I think this aspect was, we, we already covered this earlier, but we do get frequently regarding this question from the sponsor at the pre-NDA stage or the control correspondence. Uh, in terms of API device, uh, in terms of how many lots of API should be used for the MDID pair product. So we do recommend that the three different lots should be used for drug substance, device, and, uh, and critical excipients, especially for primary stability batches. In terms of the batch size uh, for the MDI and DPI, the current thinking of agency is that at least one full scale batch uh, should be manufactured. Again, that full scale should be represented at commercial scale, and at least uh, the other two batches can be one third. As far as the product characterization study is concerned, make sure that it's conducted uh, with the to be marketed configuration, and at least three batches with reasonable sample size are provided. So at the end, I just want to, you know, just to provide you a, a little tip about it. Uh, I know and as you can understand the complexity of the combination product, so from the reviewer perspective, we do recommend that please include a reviewer guide. Again, this reviewer guide can be included, uh, uh, again, as a separate document in the module 1.2 in the cover letter. Uh, you can include all high-level overview of the submission with a hyperlink, which, you know, submitted to the document. Also, can provide location of documents which are not typically found during this, uh, during, you know, during your conventional locations, and also please make sure that you have provided information kind of which contributes ease of assessment. If you do make any changes during the development registration, also you want to ensure that you also have provided tabular format for all those changes, which uh, you know again could be from the device or formulation or anything of those. And lastly, if you, uh, if you have any meetings or something, uh, we definitely recommend that you want to provide summary of key discussion points agreement, uh, uh, also within that review guide. With the closing amount, I just want to say that you know again FDA and uh, uh, and the industry have a common goals in approving the 
on timely approval of affordable generic medicines and submission call in an effective timely communication is key to the success. Uh, so we definitely en encourage industry if you, you know, please uh, adopt science and risk-based approaches for any potential changes, please communicate as soon as possible. So as to it does provide high insurance, there is no unintended consequence of change. With that, I just want to thank you everyone. Um, also want to thank VSBI and OGD, uh, OGD for, you know, and also my uh, management from OPQ, uh, Division Director Bhagwan Frege, as well as Office Director Susan Rosenfeld for giving me the opportunity. Thank you.